These are Chris Griffin's worst ever moments in Family Guy. We kick things off at number 10 with Cop and a Half Wit where Chris decides to cure Stewie's concussion in the only way he knows, by hitting him with a book. Chris, are you crazy? Shh. Let's just let him sleep this off. Chris's story starts at Stop Then Shop, where Lois is doing her usual grocery run. Stewie, of course, is making a fuss over the sight of tampons sitting on top of the cart, acting like it's some kind of catastrophe. Meanwhile, Chris asks if he can grab some raisins with his bare hands from the bulk aisle. Lois gives him the okay, but reminds him of their code word just in case he gets caught, because in the Griffin world, you never know what might happen. When Chris, in a hurry, drops Stewie's beloved Rupert. Things really take a turn when a store employee picks up Rupert and hands him back to Stewie, unknowingly sealing his fate with those dreaded words. Excuse me, ma'am, your little girl dropped her teddy bear. What? Little girl? Uh-oh, busted little girl. Yeah, Stewie did not take that well. Not one bit. Brian's there, probably chuckling to himself because he agrees Stewie's been mistaken for a girl. Stewie, still recovering from the emotional trauma of being called a girl, proudly announces he's joined the football team because what better way to prove you're a man than playing football, right? What's up, dudes? Stewie, what the hell is all this? Uh, only the most manly thing ever. A little something called American football. Brian tells him to give it up, pointing out that his short height and, well, general lack of toughness might make this a bad idea. But Stewie, being Stewie, stands firm in his decision, insisting he's already made the team. Confidence is key, folks. Fast forward to the football field, where Chris taunts the young football players, calling them the wife beaters of tomorrow. Wow, so these are the wife beaters of tomorrow. Brian, still clinging to the idea that Stewie will back out once he sees the towering opponents, but nope, Stewie's too busy admiring his football cleats complete with 12-inch heels. Ooh, my shoes have 12 little heels. They're cleats. The confidence game is strong with this one. But before the game can even start, Brian pulls Stewie aside and they run into Tyler's mom, who just happens to be on the opposing team. She doesn't hold back, flexing her kid's reflexes and threatening Stewie with a menacing shrimp insult. My Tyler would kill him out there. Okay, well, believe me, there's, there's more to him than you think. Brian's not having it, though. He tells Stewie to go back out there and take Tyler's knee out like that's ever going to happen. I mean, let's be real, Stewie's more likely to trip over his own cleats than take anyone down. Meanwhile, Chris is up to something. He's using the code word for not-so-noble reasons, of course. Hey! Oopsie poopsie! Aww. The game kicks off, and Brian asks the coach why Stewie isn't playing. Turns out, Stewie's apparently too short for the coach's standards and only good for limp handshakes after the game. But Brian, never one to let a logical argument slide, somehow manages to convince the coach otherwise. I throw a sprite at it. Well, it's not my car, but I don't care. I'm just a volunteer. All right, Griffin, get in there. Then it happens. Stewie gets crushed, literally. Those heavy football players pile on top of him like a stack of pancakes and our little guy goes down hard. Naturally, Stewie ends up with a concussion. And this is where Chris's genius medical plan comes into play. To reverse the concussion, Chris decides to hit Stewie in the head with a book. Because really, why wouldn't that work? Stewie goes out cold, but hey, in Chris's mind, it was all in the name of curing him. Sweet intentions, terrible execution. For the inside. Chris, are you crazy? Shh. Let's just let him sleep this off. Stewie wakes up in the hospital, alive and conscious. But Chris sees this as the perfect opportunity to borrow some babies from the nursery. You know, just to take them for a spin. After all, in his world, they're just free people waiting to be claimed. Chris logic at its finest always looking for a good deal, even if it's a little questionable. Coming in hot at number 9, we've got the classic Halloween on Spooner Street episode where things get a little too spooky between Chris and Meg, and by spooky, I mean cringe-worthy sibling shenanigans that'll leave you asking, wait, what just happened? So, it's Halloween in Cahog, and everyone's gearing up for some tricks and treats. Chris rolls downstairs proudly dressed as none other than Bill Cosby. But before he can even step foot outside, Lois pulls the emergency brake on that one. I mean, wearing blackface? Not a great idea, Chris. Anyway, Lois tells him to switch it up to an Indian chief costume, because apparently cultural sensitivity wasn't a high priority that day. Meanwhile, Stewie's doing his usual, saving the world from a zombie apocalypse or something. Classic Stewie, believing he's Earth's last hope. But let's not forget he's still a baby. Back to the main event, Meg struts in, rocking a naughty cat costume. Lois throws the usual shade about her Halloween tradition, watching three movies back to back so she can pretend she had fun. Oh, where are you off to? sweetie. You're gonna go see three movies in a row so it seems like you're out doing something? But plot twist. This time, Meg's actually off to a big high school party. Cue the excitement. Meg and her friends gather outside the house, absolutely buzzing about their first real party. It's a pretty big moment considering, well, no one ever invites them to anything. But hey, who needs an invite when you can crash, right? One of Meg's friends drops the brilliant idea to cover their faces for better chances at, let's say, romantic success. Meg's friend's cousin tried the same trick and managed to hook up with a guy. So, naturally, it's time for Meg and the squad to give it a go. Good luck, ladies. And we'll have a better chance of hooking up. 
good idea. We are so gonna hook up. I think we look hot. Totally hot. Ugly bitches! Moo! Fast forward to the party. It's time for spin the bottle. You know the drill. First up, some girl gets to make out with a guy dressed as Bill Clinton. Solid costume choice, dude. Now it's Meg's turn. She spins the bottle, and where does it land? They're sent off to the closet to do the deed, and after taking longer than expected, people start getting curious. Let's go. Other people want to use the closet. When they open the door, who do they find? None other than Chris and Meg. Even I had to double check, like, did they really just do that? I guess accidental sibling makeout sessions don't count as a win. Chris and Meg just earned themselves a one-way ticket to family disgrace town. Oh my god, what are you doing here? Trying to grab some boo -hoo. From your sister? I didn't know it was you. Well, who did you think it was? Some bitch, who cares? <laughs> But this isn't the only time when Meg and Chris were at each other. At number 8, we've got the time he ditched his girlfriend after blowing up in popularity in Stu Royds. Our saga kicks off in high school, where Meg and Chris are cruising down the hallway when they bump into the reigning queen of popularity herself. Naturally, Meg's dream is to be besties with Connie, so she tries to hand over the high school musical soundtrack. Of course, Connie laughs in her face, and things take a turn when her boyfriend Scott celebrates the moment by. Hey Meg, take that! <laughs> that was awesome! The joke's kind of on us, because we're smelling it. Yeah. Yeah! Awesome! Oh, so <laughs> but Connie's got bigger plans. Turns out, she's done with Scott and is looking for her next victim, uh, I mean, boyfriend. And who hasn't she dated yet? Now, who are the biggest losers in this school? Oh, well, they're Smiley McGee. Hello. Nah, I hear he's a bedwetter. And Chris Griffin? Oh my god, I could smell him from here. He's perfect. Chris Griffin. She walks right up to Chris, leaving Meg to wonder if maybe, just maybe, she was finally going to be acknowledged. Spoiler alert, nope. Meg's dream friendship will have to wait until, well, forever. Connie shoves Meg aside and hits Chris with a date request. The nicest one possible, for her standards. You and I are going on a date Saturday night. Um, okay. I'll see you then. Why would she go out with me? Next thing we know, it's pre-rally makeover time. Connie's working some magic on Chris, giving him that fresh buzz cut look in one of those thin pencil beards. How did no one see that coming? Chris, in his infinite wisdom, suggests holding Connie's hand at the rally, to which she agrees, thinking this will skyrocket his popularity. If we're dating, does that mean when we go in there, I can hold your hand? Good idea. Then everyone will think you're popular. But Chris's intentions are different as he reveals that he doesn't care about being popular, he just likes her. Connie's cold heart melts like butter. For the first time, someone's been that nice to her. They roll into the rally and jaws hit the floor. Chris Griffin's rise to fame begins, and even the jocks acknowledge him. Who saw that coming? Hey, Griffin! Griffa! Griffa Mano! Griffa Mano! Wow, the jocks have never said hello to me before. Connie decides she's not dumping Chris after all because he's the nicest guy she's ever dated. And to seal the deal, she agrees to come over for dinner. Chris is stoked at least for a moment. Wow, Connie D'Amico is coming to my house for dinner! I just hope Dad doesn't embarrass us like he did when that one-legged guy came over. All right, well, if you like movie trivia, I got one that'll stump you. Uh, of course, you're probably not really into tibia trivia. Uh, boy, that global warming, huh? They say we lost a foot of snow last winter. Dinner smooth sailing, even Meg awkwardly trying to drag Connie into her room for a makeover. Connie, of course, declines the offer. Hey, after dinner, you want to come up to my room and give each other makeovers? I don't use makeup, Meg. Poor Meg can't catch a break. Someone hug her already. Then Chris decides to host a party for all the cool kids. Naturally, Meg's not invited, because why would she be? While Meg's upstairs sobbing with her mom attempting to comfort her, Connie realizes Chris has vanished. And when she finds him, he's with two other girls. Oof, that's got a sting. You bastard! How the hell can you be cheating on me? I'm the one who made you popular! No, Connie. Beating up that Jewish kid made me popular. Come on, girls! Let's go upstairs and make out! <laughs> Connie, no longer Queen Bee, is now plotting her revenge with none other than Meg. At first, Meg brushes off Connie's offer, but one well-aimed javelin throw from Chris changes her mind real quick. All right, let's do it. Cut to the assembly where Meg gets Neil to play Chris's super private dance video in front of the whole school. And that, my friends, is how Chris's reign of popularity crumbles. The crown is officially returned to its rightful owner. Meg, she scores a small thank you from the popular girl. Not much, but it's something. And Chris, well, 
he got what he deserved. Let's hope he learned his lesson, but I wouldn't bet on it. At number seven, we've got the time Chris thought he could get away with stealing money from Lois's purse, only to be busted by none other than Meg and Chris Cross. Our little adventure kicks off at Quahog High, where Chris's shoes suddenly become the talk of the town, and not in a good way. We're laughing at Griffin's shoes. Why? What's wrong with them? I don't even know what those are. What's Teslic? These shoes, let's just say they were the kind of fashion choice only a brave soul could love. Chris claims they're super popular in Latin athletics or some nonsense, but judging by the reactions of his classmates, I don't think anyone bought it. So naturally, Chris does what any desperate teen would do. He begs Lois for a fresh pair of kicks. But come on, we all know how this is going to go down. I need to get new sneakers. What? I just bought you new sneakers. I know, but I need cooler ones. Shut up and stop complaining. When I was your age, I didn't even have sneakers. We wore stale hamburger buns. No, you didn't, Peter. Shh, he didn't know that. He's just a dumb, fat loser. Did you see his shoes? Fast forward to later that evening when Lois and Peter are out for date night. Meanwhile, back at home, Chris stumbles upon what could only be described as a golden opportunity. He's walking past Lois's room when he spots Peter's purse sitting right there. Yeah, you heard me right. Peter's got a purse now. Don't ask. Thinking he's hit the jackpot, Chris dives in, but instead of cash, all he finds is a note that reads, that say, I farted on your car with his insurance info. But hold up, Lois's purse is right there too, just hanging out, tempting Chris like a big old dollar sign. And we all know Chris's brain isn't exactly hardwired for good decisions, so of course, he snatches the cash. With his newly acquired riches in hand, Chris feels like a criminal mastermind until he doesn't. Because Meg walks in at the worst possible moment and catches him in full victory mode. Busted. And of course, Meg being Meg isn't just going to let this slide. She sees this as her chance to finally get one up on her little bro. Meg starts milking the situation for all it's worth, making Chris do all kinds of ridiculous things. Things. Watching an officer and a gentleman with her? Check. Reading aloud the most cringe-worthy parts of the movie? You bet. <laughs> That's gonna be you someday, Meg. I know it will! I just know it will! Even putting contact lenses in her eyes? Oh yeah, she's going full petty mode here. But poor Meg, nothing ever really works out for her, and Chris eventually hits rock bottom. And in typical Chris fashion, decides his only option is to run away. And where does he go? To Herbert's house, obviously. Our favorite creepy old guy. Herbert is so shocked to see Chris at his doorstep that he has to pinch himself to make sure he's not dreaming. He even sets the mood for some quality time with Chris, but Chris, being clueless as ever, is just over there asking life's deep questions like what's life really about? Mr. Herbert, what's life really all about? Well, I suppose it's about trying new things, sampling the sweet and the savory, not being afraid to take everything life wants to throw up on into you. Wow, I never looked at it like that before. Meanwhile, Meg's starting to feel a little guilty for pushing Chris away, so she goes on a mission to track him down. Herbert, on the other hand, has something a little more romantic in mind. He plans a cozy dinner date with Chris, but when Chris suggests they just stay in and cook, Herbert's had enough. Even the creepiest old guy in town has his limits. Herbert kicks Chris out, and just like that, Chris is homeless again. Cue the sweet sibling reunion. Meg finds Chris, apologizes for blackmailing him, and they hug it out like only Griffin siblings can. But let's be real with stealing from Lois worth it. Probably not. But this is Chris we're talking about. At number six, we have the unforgettable moment when Chris does something utterly bonkers just to see his crush again in Long John Peter. We kick things off in the vet's office. The Griffin family is there for Brian's checkup, but Chris, he's in his own world, lost in a daydream about his one-sided love. His heart practically singing ballads to itself. Like this, it's all brand new. You feel it in my kiss. Unfortunately, no one informed Chris that serenading someone in his head doesn't exactly spark a conversation in real life. Chris becomes desperate to see her again, leading Lois to suggest it might happen if Brian gets sick again. Lucky for Chris, he thinks he knows just how to make that happen. Oh boy! Hey, Brian, look! <laughs> Brian's sick! Mom, get your keys! Fast forward to the next vet trip, not for Brian this time, but for Peter's parrot, which met an untimely demise during one of Peter's infamous car pirate escapades. Chris, seeing this as his golden opportunity, strikes up a conversation with Anna, and because no awkward teen romance is complete without an embarrassing story, Chris dives right into the classic pooping tale to break the ice. Um, I'm Chris. Sometimes I have to poop for a long time. Now you say something. <laughs> Not exactly Romeo-level smoothness, but hey, it worked. He got her number and even scored a date. Way to go, Chris. Now it's date night, and Chris is trying his hardest to act normal. Which, given he's a griffin, means it's anything but. He nearly blows it with his awkwardness, but luckily for him, Anna's a cool cucumber and asks him to chill out. Did you ever make it with one of the dogs? What? I mean, uh, uh, did you enjoy your appetizer? It hasn't come yet. 
Oh, um... Later, Chris invites Anna over to hang out at the house, and in true Griffin fashion, chaos ensues. Anna accidentally spills her drink, and Chris offers to clean it up. Except, as Peter quickly points out, real men don't clean up spills. In classic Peter fashion, he advises Chris to treat her like crap the next time he sees her. Fatherly wisdom at its finest, folks. Trust me, Chris. The next time you see this girl, treat her like crap. And you'll be cooler than a mid-80s novelty answering machine message. Naturally, Chris takes this advice to heart. At their next meeting, Chris tries out Peter's real man approach, and it doesn't go well. Ah, uh, yes, can I have two tickets? One man and one bitch that needs to do what I say? What? That's not funny, Chris. Here's your ticket. Pick that up! Oh, Chris, you really blew it this time. And of course, we all know who to thank for that one. Good old Peter. But don't worry, Peter's got a plan. To cheer Chris up, he suggests getting back out there and dating other girls. Totally normal advice. As you might expect, Peter completely sabotages every day Chris goes on. Even a blind date crashes and burns when the girl takes one look at Chris and decides her night would be better spent literally anywhere else. Whoa. Chris, still hung up on Anna, can't shake the guilt. Loy suggests he find an excuse to see her again. And because Griffin logic is flawless, Chris decides the best way to do this is to hit Brian over the head with a chair. Seriously, all's fair in love and war, right? So off they go to the vet, and Chris, with Brian still seeing stars, makes his big move. He asks Anna for one more chance, and she says yes. They share another kiss, and poor Brian? Well, let's just say he deserves a medal for taking one for the team. Because if patching up broken hearts isn't saintly work, I don't know what is. Okay, somebody really needs to help me here. Number five is when Chris pulls a classic move by kidnapping his own brother just to gain the upper hand in a game of words and secondhand spoke. It all starts when Brian and Stewie drop Chris off at school. Everything seems normal until four bullies swoop in and do what bullies do best. Hey, fat ass, your boobs are bigger than your sisters. Chris, in true form, tries to fight back with words. Except, well, it's Chris so naturally all he manages to do is cry and make a quick exit. Well... That's your comeback? <laughs> oh, man! Hey, sometimes running away is the best strategy, right? Stewie witnesses this sad display and decides to take pity on his brother. He pulls Chris aside for a little heart-to-heart -heart and basically tells him he's got to stand up for himself. You really have got to stand up for yourself. Stewie, it's not so easy. What would you say if I said, hey there, shorty? I'd say have another donut, you albino gorilla. But of course, we all know Chris isn't exactly the king of clever comebacks. Luckily, Stewie has the art of words down to a science, and he's determined to pass this gift on to Chris. Chris. The next day, Stewie tags along with Chris to school, but this time there's a twist Stewie is hiding in Chris's backpack, ready to feed him lines like a tiny evil teleprompter. Here, put me on your back and repeat what I say. Quick, here they come! Once again, the bullies come at Chris, but this time he fights back with Stewie's help, of course. Okay, now say... I heard you were born out of your mom's butt. I heard that from your mom while I was doing her. You're a butt baby, that's why you've got moles all over your chest. Leftover birth duke. <laughs> the delivery? Hey, let's just say it wasn't exactly smooth, but for now it'll do. Later, Chris spots Neil getting picked on by the same bullies. Feeling all high and mighty with his newfound confidence, Chris steps in to defend Neil. Not only does he scare off the bullies, but he also scores a girl's number. Yeah, Chris is really living his best life right now. Back away, foul wench! Your wide hips hold no temptation for me! I mean, you have... Uh, a vulva and fallopian tubes. Finally, a guy who listens. Here's my number. Call me. During assembly, the principal asks if anyone wants to run for student body president. And guess what? Thanks to Chris's sudden surge in popularity, he gets nominated. The next day, Chris asks Stewie for more killer comebacks to use in his campaign. But Stewie, being the tough love type, tells Chris he's done teaching him. Naturally, this sends Chris into full-on panic mode. So, in a totally rational move, Chris kidnaps Stewie, shoving him into his backpack where he's held captive for a whopping five days. During the class president election, Stewie finally refuses to help. Chris, desperate to win, threatens to keep Stewie locked up forever. Stewie reminds Chris Chris that he helped him earn respect, and this is the thanks he gets. A backpack jail. Stewie hits Chris with some tough love, telling him he's become the very thing he used to hate, a bully. Chris gets emotional and decides to drop out of the election. At least he learned something, right? Sure, he didn't become class president, but hey, on the bright side, those bullies never messed with him again. And for that, we can thank the almighty Stewie. This isn't the first time Chris has gone off the rails with his wild antics. At number four, he's back at it again, this time kidnapping Meg and better off Meg. It all kicks off when Meg rolls up to school, only to find the place completely deserted. Turns out it's skip day, 
and no one bothered to let her know. Meg, seriously, are you for real? After getting ditched by the entire school, she heads home, only to discover the family is at the fair. They're hanging out with a barrel dressed as Meg. Yeah, they legit thought that thing was her. Honestly, I bought it too for a hot second. Meg tries to explain she's not with them, but nah, the family's too busy having a grand old time with their wooden Meg. Okay, Meg, if this is you, what's your birthday? March 23rd. I have no idea if that's correct. Good day, Shay. Sorry about that, everyone. Now let's get back to the fair and enjoy our March 23rd. Frustrated, she heads to the bowling alley, where she spends the day knocking down pins and watching those cringy animations. Meanwhile, the news reports that a teenage girl has died in a car crash. Apparently, she had Meg's driver's license. The family finally clued in, realizes it wasn't Meg with them at the fair, it was the barrel. Peter, Lois, it pains me above the waist to tell you that Meg is dead. What? What are you talking about? Meg's right here. <gasps> Meanwhile, Meg's off bowling her heart out, and somehow the alley attendant gave her license to the wrong girl, the one who died. Next up, Meg's funeral. It's as depressing as you'd expect, maybe worse. Barely anyone shows up, and they're still using the barrel as her picture. Yikes. Meanwhile, Chris is soaking up all the sympathy like it's a free buffet. Girls are all over him, showering him with kisses and attention. Chris is definitely not hating this. Turns out, Meg is watching the whole thing go down. Seeing her sad, sad funeral, she decides to ditch town and start fresh somewhere else. Back at home, the Griffins are struggling through dinner, trying to act like they miss her. Spoiler alert, they don't. Uh, I hope everyone enjoys tonight's dinner. It was Meg's favorite. <laughs> there, there, Lois. Stop your crying. Stop it. Please stop. Stop. Stop it. Stop crying. Stop crying. Stop crying. Stop. Uh, before we eat, would anyone like to say something about Meg? Over in her new city, Meg's doing all right. She's got a cozy apartment, some new friends, and a chance to actually enjoy life for once. But Chris? Oh, he's thriving. He's getting selfies with the girls and high fives from the guys. Chris is living his dream life. But the party doesn't last forever. Chris gets a call from Meg, who's ready to spill the beans. She wants to meet up, but Chris isn't about to give up his newfound popularity. Hello? Hey, Chris. <gasps> Meg? Are you alive? Yes, I'll explain everything. Can you come meet me? Okay, still the cemetery? In true Chris fashion, he shoves her into the back of a moving van. To keep his cloud intact, he leaves her tied up in some creepy abandoned warehouse while Meg tries to Houdini her way out. While this is going down, the school throws a big ceremony for Meg, and the Griffins also show up. Desperate, Meg pulls a wild move. She smashes her face into the ground, blood everywhere, just enough to slip free. Meg bursts into the ceremony, looking rough but alive. The family's stunned. Lois asks what happened, and Meg points a shaky finger at Chris. At first, the crowd thinks Chris saved her, there's confetti, and everything. But Chris admits he was behind the whole thing. His weak apology somehow still earns him a hero's exit, carried out like he's the school quarterback. I owe my sister an apology. I shouldn't have treated her the way I did. And I think if Meg were here today, she'd be the first one to agree. I am here! I'm right here! Anyway, Meg, wherever you are, I'm sorry. <laughs> At number three, Chris's pimple takes control of his motor functions and makes him do bad stuff in Brian the Bachelor. Chris walks into the kitchen to greet his family, but their attention is immediately drawn to the massive pimple on his cheek. Lois assures him it's just part of becoming a man and suggests they'll deal with it later. However, Chris has already named the pimple Doug, signaling it's here to stay like an uninvited house guest. But I don't want to get rid of my Zed. I like him. He's my friend. His name is Doug. I just wish I didn't have to look at it. Well, we have to look at your anus all day. Thank you. Soon after, Doug comes to life, speaking to Chris, who is more than thrilled to have a new friend. Lois expresses her concern about Chris's attachment to the pimple, but Peter dismisses it, seeing no real issue. Doug, however, quickly begins leading Chris into trouble. The two start their mischief by setting a bag on fire in front of Joe's house and escalating to vandalizing shop walls with anti-Mayor West slogans, which, let's be honest, is probably the least surprising thing that's happened in Quahog. Oh, good lord! Is that... Duty! I'm doing the dishes, Joe. I'll change you in a minute. Lois becomes increasingly worried and checks on Chris, but his room is empty. Moments later, Chris sneaks back through the window, revealing that Doug is now influencing his actions. Chris casually mentions that Doug has told him he no longer needs to listen to Lois, which prompts her to decide it's time to have the pimple removed at the pharmacy. What did I tell you? She's trying to drive us apart. We can't let that happen. I am in no mood. 
The next morning, Lois and Peter head to the pharmacy, only to find it looking like a war zone. It's pretty clear who's to blame. Later, during a family dinner where Brian introduces his new date, Doug prompts Chris to lift the woman's shirt in front of everyone, leading to immediate chaos. Soon after, Joe arrives to confirm Chris was responsible for ransacking the pharmacy as well. Peter chases Chris around the house, belt in hand, in a fit of frustration. Ah! There! Are you happy, Doug? <laughs> Christopher Cross Griffin, what are you doing? Joe, what are you doing here? Peter, Lois, we have proof that it was Chris who vandalized Goldman's pharmacy. I know it! I know it! I didn't want to believe it, but it's true! Oh, God, what happened to my baby? Who sold you the drugs? I can't believe this! I can't believe it! I can't believe it! I can't believe it! I can't believe it! Chris, realizing the chaos he's caused, decides Doug needs to go, but Doug has taken full control, manipulating Chris's mind. I'm not gonna listen to you anymore. Oh, yeah? Well, I'm inside your head now, fatty, and I just might reach into your brain and do this! Ow! Okay, okay, I'll listen! In a final attempt to break free, Chris tricks Doug into visiting a doctor, under the guise of going to a bacon factory. Once Doug realizes the truth, he becomes violent, pulling out a gun and threatening Chris. An intense fight ensues, but Chris manages to inject Doug with a cure, finally ending his reign over Chris. And just like that, Doug is gone. Rest easy, mate. At number two, Peter comes dangerously close to having one of the most bizarre moments with Chris in the episode titled Fresh Here. It starts with Chris wanting to spend some quality father-son time with Peter. Innocent enough, right? But of course, Peter isn't interested. He straight up lies to Chris, claiming he's too busy. Ah, uh, Chris, I was just lying to you so you'd go away. But if you leave me alone now, I'll give you a billion dollars. You got a deal! When Brian suggests Peter should bond with Chris, Peter brushes it off, mumbling something about unspoken bonds, yeah, because that's a thing. Since Peter's not stepping up, Chris turns to his wealthy grandfather to fill the void. And surprisingly, Carter is all in. The two start hanging out, doing weird rich people stuff like tracking pizza races and starting their own band. Somehow, Chris even ends up teaching Carter a few new things. And the worst part about it is I can't have sex. God, I wish there was a way I could just do it myself. You know, just, just to be done and napping within four minutes. Let me show you something. That was amazing. And Linda Carter wasn't actually here? No, that was just in your mind. You can count this as one of his worst moments as well. Anyway, when Carter offers to cover Chris's fee, Chris politely declines, and Carter is so impressed that he makes Chris the sole heir to his entire fortune. Didn't see that one coming. Maybe I should try declining money from relatives. You never know what's coming. I mean, who knew that turning down free money could be such a lucrative career move? Chris has basically hit the jackpot, and all he had to do was say no. And speaking of people hitting the jackpot, Peter's watching all this unfold, and suddenly he's jealous big time. But Grandpa, I don't even want the money. See? This is exactly why you should get it! So refreshing! Well, I, I don't want it either. Good, because you're not getting it. Come on, what are you doing? Listen, Carter, you take me out of your will, I'm taking you out of mine. Peter, that wasn't your will. That was your birth certificate. Oh, no. <gasps> There's no light! There's only fire! His own son is now Carter's favorite, and Peter can't handle it. So, naturally, he hatches a ridiculous plan to win Chris back, hoping to score a piece of that inheritance for himself. Peter starts copying everything Chris does, dressing like him, watching movies together, and even in a disturbing twist, going as far as to take out one of Chris's bullies. I wonder why this guy is roaming free. Hey, Chris, hey, you remember that kid you said was bullying you at school? Well, here's his head. Ah! That's not even him! That's the deaf kid! Oh, that was sign language. I thought he was trying to defend himself with terrible karate. When Peter realizes his plan isn't working, he cranks the insanity up to 11 by proposing to Chris for marriage. At first, Chris is obviously confused and hesitant, as anyone would be. But when he realizes it means spending more time with Peter, he actually says yes. When you're married, you get to spend all your time together doing things like playing catch and going fishing, right? Well, the best marriages give each other space, but yes, Chris. Then yes, I will marry you, Dad. To make it even crazier, Peter goes ahead and signs divorce papers from Lois in his sleep. And just like that, Peter and Chris are off to Vermont for their wedding. It's all going according to Peter's bizarre plan until Lois and the family show up just in time to stop the madness. Thank God for that. And while it's easy to pin all this on Peter, Chris wasn't exactly innocent here. He knew this whole thing was way off the rails, but he went along with it anyway. Oh, Chris, what were you thinking? Thank you, Chris. Stop the wedding! Lois! How did you find out about this? 
Peter, several people have called the police about a man marrying his son. It's not normal. Peter? Peter Griffin? Oh, God. Is everyone from your past here to walk you down the aisle? At number one, we have Chris crossing all lines of indecency to get popular in an episode titled Teacher's Heavy Pet. The episode begins with Chris feeling dejected after being nominated for Homecoming Dunce for the fourth year in a row. To make matters worse, Lois announces that she has been hired as a substitute teacher for his class. Naturally, Chris is mortified. He's already the butt of every joke in school, and now his mom is going to be teaching him. That's social suicide. You saw how unpopular I am at school. Having my mother as a teacher will make things worse. Lois tries to reassure him by saying she is registered under her maiden name and will disguise herself, but Chris isn't convinced and storms off. The next day, Lois strides into the classroom as Mrs. Peter Schmidt, and while the students are hooting and hollering, Chris is sinking lower in his seat from sheer embarrassment. But hey, at at least no one knows she's his mom. Later, the cool kids invite Chris to join them at lunch, which is unusual. But of course, they're only interested in getting the lowdown on Mrs. Peter Schmidt. Chris, trying to play it cool, awkwardly blurts out that she's hot. If something's not totally repulsive, it's hot. Don't you think she's hot? Yeah, I guess she's a total hottie. The cool kids are immediately suspicious, but strangely impressed. It gets even worse when two of them spot Chris in a car with her later, and their imaginations run wild. The next day, the cool kids confront Chris with the big question, did he score with Mrs. Peter Schmidt? Chris knows this is a disaster waiting to happen, but he also knows his social status is at stake. So naturally, he makes up a story. The cool kids surprisingly believe it and crown him the king of dating. I mean, really, who does that? There's a bit more going on. I don't think there's a lot of do left on his lily, right? You know what? What, Griffin? We're gonna carry you out on our shoulders because of sex. All right, just be careful. Easy, I'm husky. Before long, rumors spread like wildfire. Meg finds out and warns Chris that if this continues, Lois could end up in jail. But Chris isn't about to let a little thing like the law stop his newfound popularity. He keeps the lie alive until the cool kids start getting suspicious again. This time, they demand a naked picture of Mrs. Peter Schmidt, and Chris is banished from their lunch table until he delivers. And she'd do anything to make the sale. I showed her a thick wad of ones, and we were off to the races on a brown leather couch next to an empty CD tower. That's just porn. Yeah, you're just making this whole thing up. No, we really had sex. After a ton of hesitation, Chris sneaks into Lois's bathroom and snaps a picture. The next day, when the cool kids demand proof, Chris nervously hands over the photo, making them promise not to share it with anyone. Naturally, they lie and blast the picture to the whole school, even the principal. Lois is called to the principal's office, expecting to get busted for her fake master's degree. But when she sees the photo, her jaw drops. She storms home to confront Chris, who spills the whole truth that he just wanted a little popularity. Surprisingly, Lois understands. I just wanted to be in with the cool kids no matter what. I saw popularity and I went for it. Oh, honey, you wanted something and you lied. You were manifesting. Chris eventually comes clean to his classmates, admitting that everything was a big lie. He braces for the inevitable downfall, but before he can fully lose his newfound status, Lois valiantly steps up and backs his story, claiming she really is dating him. The episode ends with Lois getting sentenced to six years in prison, while Chris basks in his newfound popularity, once again, at the cost of his mom's freedom. Talk about shooting your gun off someone else's shoulder. Ah, uh, thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe and like the video for more Family Guy content.